So 1 Timothy chapter 6, very famous portion of Scripture here um, regarding you know, the love of money as the root of all evil and, and um, you know, a, lot, a lot of great content in this chapter. And what we're preaching about this evening is the, this, this movement of preachers, is the, they're called prosperity preachers. Essentially, what they teach and what they preach is that if you're doing what's right, if you're living a godly, righteous life, then God will bless you financially and will reward you with good things. And they also, this also gets into a lot of the, the TV evangelists, the ones that are, on, that are on the screen and they're telling you, you know, God wants you to send your money in. God wants you to give these great big donations. And if you do that, then God will open up the windows of heaven and He'll pour out money on you and He'll pour out all these blessings. And it's a false gospel that they preach and it's a false teaching that they teach. And, and what they're doing is they're basically just scam artists trying to get money out of people. They preach for filthy lucre's sake. And I'm going to show that. First, though, I want to start off in 1 Timothy chapter 6, there's many, many references. I'm not even going to be able to get to all of them as we preach through this tonight regarding false prophets. I'm going to try to stay focused in on the prosperity preaching that's going on. And just so that there's no confusion, I'm talking about the Joel Osteens that are out there today. I'm talking about the TBN televangelists that are making, you know, telling everybody to, to send in all of their money and that they'll get blessed of God. And that, and really, one of the things that they teach is that. One of the ways that you can know if you're doing right by God is if you have a lot of money, which is ridiculous. And we're gonna, I'm going to give you plenty of scripture tonight that's going to destroy that thinking and that, and that mentality. And I, because a lot of people, what happens is these preachers, if you want to call them that, these prosperity preachers, they're very charismatic. They're able to tell good stories. They're able to get you to listen. They might be able to pull on your heartstrings a little bit. But it's a scam. They're trying to make merchandise of you. And I'm going to show you the scripture that, that warns us about these type of preachers. But here we are in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll start reading again in verse number 3. The Bible says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and stripes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Look at verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. That means they don't know the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. He said these, these preachers, these prophets that, that are preaching, that are destitute of the truth, they don't know the truth. The truth is not in them. They suppose that gain is godly. It's gain meaning financial wealth. The gain that you have, the, the wealth that you have, they say that is godliness. If you have a lot of wealth, then you must be very godly. And that's why you see these phony preachers driving around in their Mercedes and BMWs and they have these multi-million dollar houses. And you look at the net worth of like someone like Joel Osteen, one of the biggest names out there, T.D. Jakes. Is another one. You look at these phonies out there and they're multi-millionaires, if not billionaires. I don't know their exact net worth. I know it's in the millions. I know for sure they're in the millions. And look, don't tell me, oh yeah, you're just jealous. Look, I don't care about their stinking money. What I'm saying is that that is, the, is, a, is a sign. What you, you don't even have to look at the amount of money that they have. I'm just showing you that that's the result of what they're doing and that's why they're doing what they're doing. And we're going to get into some scriptures regarding that too. But you can look at the very message that they say themselves. And you'll be able to see that they're false prophets. They're not teaching the truth. They're destitute of the truth. And that's why they preach this message saying that gain is godliness. It says from such withdraw thyself. Don't be partakers of them. Don't, don't go to their churches. Don't buy their books. Don't buy the best your best life now. Don't be reading that garbage. Withdraw yourself from those false prophets. Withdraw yourself from those phonies. The Bible says, it to, to, counter, to counteract that, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You say, you want to know what's gainful? It's not having a lot of riches. That's not your gain. That's not godliness. Godliness is being content with what you have, whatever that may be, 
and not worrying about making a whole bunch of money and just being content with the things that God has blessed you with, whether he's given you a lot or a little bit, being content with that, he says, that is godliness. When you have contentment, that is great gain. Verse 7 says, for we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Why are we focused on these things? Why do those things even matter? We didn't, we didn't enter the world with anything and we can't take any of it with us. The money, the gold, the boats, the cars, the houses, all the stuff that you can accumulate while you're alive on this earth, none of it's going with you. It's all going to be burned up, so why are you focused so much on it? Verse 8, and having food and raiment. Raiment means clothing. Hey, you got food, you got clothing, let us be there with content. We should be satisfied. We, we have enough. We've got, we've got clothing on. Everybody here has clothing on. And if you have food, which I know we have food, let's be content. That's it. We don't need to be worried about anything else. We don't need to have these, these desires and these lusts for having more money and having more things and, and making that such a big deal. And, you know, honestly, there's always, you know, within marriages and within relationships, with other things, money always seems to be one of the biggest factors of why people get into fights. And the Bible's saying, look, if you have food and raiment, be content. Be happy with that. Don't worry about getting all this money for all these other things because you don't need it. We ought to be happy with what God has given us. And it says here in verse 9, but they that will be rich, which means they that want to be wished, those people who want to have riches, that are looking to get the riches of this world, but they that will be rich fall into temptation. And it doesn't say they may fall or they might fall. It says they fall. They fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is a trap. You're falling into a trap. If you are just desiring to be rich, if you're just desiring to have a lot of money, it's a trap. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. That doesn't sound very pleasant. For the love of money is the root of all evil. You want to have a lot of evil in your life? Love money. Be focused on making a lot of money. Have your priorities be about money. And you are sure to have all kinds of evil. You are sure to have all evil. That's because that's the root of all evil, is that love of money. You will have evil in your life if you love money. It says, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. It means run away from these things. Get away from that. You don't want to have many sorrows in your life. Get away from that. Flee away from that. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. We ought to have nothing to do with these phony prophets, these false prosperity preachers. But what's their motivation? You're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Flip back to chapter 1. We'll see the Bible describes these people quite a bit. The Bible gives us a lot of warnings. Scripture that we need to heed because we need to know that these people are out there. There's a lot of deceivers. There's a lot of people who are trying to, to hurt you, trying to do evil, or they just love money themselves and they're full of evil, which is going to hurt you. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, excuse me. I read my notes wrong. Titus chapter 1. Just go forward. You got 1 and 2 Timothy, then Titus. Go to Titus chapter 1. Starting in verse number 5, the Bible reads, For this cause left I thee in Crete, this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy saying, I left you in Crete for this reason, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, 
So he's saying, look, I wanted, I left you in Crete. You need to ordain elders. You need to get pastors of churches. These churches are getting started. You got a lot of believers. We have a lot of converts to Christ. They need to be gathering together in a church and they need someone to lead them. So your job, Titus, in all these areas around Crete, you need to be ordaining people to, to be an elder, to be a pastor for that local congregation. And here's what you need to look for when you're ordaining somebody. They need to be blameless. They need to be the husband of a one wife. They need to have faithful children. They need to know how to raise their kids. They're not unruly. They're not accused of riot. It says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, of, not given to filthy lucre. And that's an important one, not given to filthy lucre. Lucre is money. It means they're not given over to money. That's not a, a motivation, a motivating factor for them in the things that they do. It's just going to be all about money. But a lover of hospitality. Hospitality, if you're hospitable, you're going to be generous. You're not going to be tight with your money and, and being worried about the filthy lucre. You're going to be hospitable and generous with the things that you have. It's a complete opposite. You're not going to be greedy. A lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Four. So all of these things, all these qualifications, you need to have those in an elder because for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. There are a lot of people that are tricking people out there. There's a lot of deceivers out there, a lot of deception. You need to have somebody that fits this bill that's going to be a teacher of God's word because you have these vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, look at this, for filthy lucre's sake. An elder or pastor of a church, a man of God, a preacher that's going to get up and teach and say, thus saith the Lord, and, and try, to, try to explain God's word and get up and, and, and show you, show the people their sin, show the people you know, what God wants for them in their life. Is something that ought to be done because they care about people, because they love God and they love people. And the, the, the pastor's job, the preacher's job, is to make you better. The reason why I come up here and do this is to help you out. It's not for my own glory. It's not for my own praise. It's not so I can make a ton of money. And just so you know, I don't make any money doing this. Not that I think it's wrong to get paid, but I just don't. That's not my motivating factor. I don't, I don't preach for filthy lucre's sake. That isn't my intention. If that were my intention, there would be a lot more false doctrine. I'd be saying a lot more things that people would just want to hear instead of what they need to hear. But it says here that these deceivers, these liars, are subverting whole houses. They're tricking a lot of people. They're, they're, they're very good in the art of deception. And they're subverting whole houses, teaching things that they ought not. Things that aren't true. Things that are going to destroy other people's lives. But they don't care about those people because they're just doing it for money. Their whole motivation is just, how much money can I make? That is the motivation of the false prophet. The motivation of the prosperity preachers that are out there today. Look at them all. All the prosperity gospel preachers, they all have a ton of money because that's what they care about and they're not telling people the truth, which is why you'll never hear Joel Osteen preach about sin. You'll never hear him preach about... He's always dancing around the issues. He gets on these talk shows. He'll get on Larry King. He'll get on these other people you know, interviewing him. And they'll try to pin him down and, and just really question him on something extremely wicked, like homosexuality. Like, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that. Yeah, you know what? I just, I think everybody's okay. You know, yeah, well, it's a sin. Yeah, but you know, God loves us. And he has this pansy attitude and he will never say anything that anybody does is wrong because he's a stinking liar and a deceiver and all he cares about is getting people's money because it's a popular thing these days for someone to say, hey, everybody's just fine. We're all going to make it to heaven one way or another. 
Yeah, that's what everybody wants to hear. I'm doing great. I don't have to change anything about my life. Everything's just fine. God loves me, and, and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. That's what everybody wants to hear. People pay to hear that. The ignorant people that don't want to know the truth for themselves, that are afraid to know the truth for themselves, that, that don't like to hear the truth, they'll, they'll gladly pay for someone to lie to them. And that's why you have so many of these false prophets out there now that'll do it for them. Because they don't care about those people either. They don't care about the truth. They don't love the truth. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Just one more place that, that explains when someone is taking the oversight, when somebody is, is filling a role of an elder or a pastor in a church. That should be something that's done willingly, that you're not forced into doing, you're not constrained into doing it. And it's not for money. And it doesn't just say money, it says filthy lucre. Filthy lucre, because that's all it is. That's stinking filthy lucre that's just, that's dirty money that, that you don't need it. That's not the rewards that we're trying to achieve. 2 Peter chapter 2 talks all about false prophets. That's what these people are. They're deceivers. They're false prophets. 2 Peter 2 verse number 1 reads, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Look, these false prophets, they don't just, just sound a megaphone and try to let everybody know <coughs> that they're a false prophet. It says they privily shall bring in damnable heresies. They, they secretly, they privately are trying to introduce damnable heresies. They're doing it on purpose and they're doing it knowing it's a damnable heresy because they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Because they're false prophets. It says, even to the point, they bring in these damnable heresies that even deny the Lord that bought them. It gets so bad, it just completely denies the Lord. You say, oh, the Lord that bought them, does that mean they're saved? No, because Jesus Christ's blood was, was shed to pay for the sins and pay for the souls of every man. But it doesn't do them any good if they haven't accepted Christ as their Savior. But He did shed His blood to pay for them. Verse 2, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. There's a lot of people out there following them. That's why, you know, Joel Osteen's church is one of the, I think, the biggest or one of the biggest in the entire United States or maybe even in the world. I don't know. It's this huge mega church. Many people are following their pernicious ways. Their books are bestsellers. The T.D. Jakes, you know, they draw all these crowds. Many people are out there following these guys. It says, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So because of the things that they do and they say, they actually make the way of truth be evil spoken of. They may, oh, those fundamentalists, oh yeah, you're one of those people, huh? You're one of those people, oh, you think we have to follow these rules. People speak evil of that because they're being lied to by these false prophets. Verse number three. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Their covetous, their greed, their desire for other things they don't have, it says, because of their covetousness, with feigned words, their fake words, the, 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 the things that they say that they don't even necessarily mean, they're just saying things to make merchandise of you. Anything to make a buck. They, they, have, they have no integrity. They don't care about the things that they say as long as it's going to bring in more money for themselves. That's why it's feigned words. It's faked. 
Jump down to verse 13. The Bible reads, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. It goes on and on about false prophets. We're just going to skip down to verse 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. In heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam the son of Bosor who loved the wages of unrighteousness. They're saying they're just like Balaam. What happened with Balaam? Well, the, the, the king wanted to, you know, call up Balaam. He's saying, you know, I want you to prophesy against the children of Israel. I want you to come up here and I want you to prophesy against them. And he's like, I'll pay you all this money. I'll give you, know, he's giving them all this stuff. And Balaam really wanted to do it. God told him to wait. He says, well, you know what? If they come and get you, then you can go with them. And what did he do? He didn't wait for them to come and get you. He just went anyways. Because he was, he was ready to go. He was ready to get that money. He, they followed, you know, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. It says in verse 16, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet, the craziness of the prophet. What are you doing going against and trying to preach against the Lord's anointed? Look at verse 17. It says, these are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with the tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They're reprobates. They are rejected by God. They are damned to hell forever. All these descriptions of wells without water, you know, they're, they're reserved, the mist of darkness is reserved forever. It says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. Yeah, they talk a big game. They say, yo, you'll be free. Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. And what they do is they use the lust of the flesh. And they tell people, yeah, you know, send in all this money. Reach back into your pocket, pull out more money, and God's going to bless you even further. It's like people who just are addicted to buying lottery tickets and trying to win it big. Because they're thinking, oh, well, I only got to give like five or ten dollars, but hey, I might get five thousand back. And it's that covetous attitude. It's that greed. It's that lust of the flesh of, wow, man, if I just had five grand or ten grand, what could I do with that money? And these people feed off of that. These people, these preachers will tell you, if you can just... You know, send in right now. Send in one hundred dollars. God will bless you beyond your wildest dreams. You you want to get a thousand dollars back? Give us a hundred. And I've literally heard them say like dollar amounts like that, and promising that God is just going to bless them with that. And they're liars. The Bible never says anything like that. But this is what they do. They promise them liberty. They promise them all these great things. And they themselves are the servants of corruption. They allure through the lusts of the flesh. That's how they trap people. That's how they get people in. And the only reason that these, these false prophets, these prosperity preachers even exist is because there are a lot of people that want to hear the lies. There are people that that just sounds good to them and they want to keep hearing about it. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 30. Or actually, you know what? I'll read from Isaiah 30. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Isaiah 30 verse 8 says, Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. They're saying we want to be lied to. There is a group of people that are like this. They don't want to hear the Bible. They don't want to hear the law of the Lord. They want to have nothing to do with it. They go to the preachers and they say, you know what? I, I don't want to hear that preaching. 
Say something smooth. Say something nice. Tell me how good I am. Tell me things that I'm going to want to hear. You know, don't, don't bring up the things I do that are bad. I don't want to hear it. I want to go. I want to feel spiritual. I want to, I want to hear from you that God thinks I'm just fine. There's a lot of people out there like that. And to me, it boggles my mind because I've always just been interested in, well, what's the truth? I just want to know what's right. I want to know what's true. I'll deal with the result of that. Whether that be a, a, a pleasant thing, an unpleasant thing, you know, just tell me the truth. I don't want to be lied to. But there are plenty of people that are willing to be lied to and knowingly be lied to. According to Isaiah 30, it says, Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. We don't want that God before us because they want another God. Wherefore, thus saith the, Lord, the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay there. I say, look, because you despise God's word, look, you're trusting in oppression. Sin is going to oppress you, and that's what you want more of. And perverseness. He says, and you stay upon, you rely on that. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessels that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it assured to take fire from the hearth or to take water withal out of the pit. He's saying God's destruction is going to come quick because you have this attitude. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 1. This is where I had you turn. 2 Timothy 4, 1 reads, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This is what a preacher should be doing. Reproving, telling people that they're wrong. Rebuking, telling people that they're wrong. And exhorting. With all long suffering, you suffer the people long to get right with God. And doctrine, teaching truth, teaching what's right, not teaching lies. He continues on and says, For, so because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Again, this is the reason why these people even exist, these prosperity preachers, is because there's people like this who can't endure the sound doctrine. They don't want to hear that adultery is, is worthy of death. They don't want to hear that fornication is wrong. They don't want to hear that almost that, that a man lying with mankind as he lies with a woman should be stoned with stones. Their blood should be upon them. They don't want to hear that. They say, oh, I got a relative that's queer. Well, I've already, I've already committed for I've done these bad things. Well, they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear how bad they are, but they are bad. And if you don't hear about them, then how is anyone ever going to learn and get right? But they have itching ears. They've got, they've got this, this itch, and they just want you to scratch it. What happens when you get a really, a really bad itch? Where you're so, you know, like in the middle of your back, like, oh, man, I got this itch. It feels so good when you get someone to scratch that itchy spot for you, right? It just, it just makes you feel so good. And that's what they're looking for. That's why it says here that they have, they heap to themselves, they gather to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want that teacher just to make them feel real good. Oh, yeah, scratch it. Oh, yeah, that feels real good. Yeah, thanks. Now I feel great. That's what they're looking for. And, you know, when you hear the truth, it's not always going to make you feel that good. It might sting a little bit. But it's the truth. You know, and then there's a, there are other people that get sucked into this stuff 
just because they think it sounds good, not necessarily that they want to be deceived. You know, there, I believe there's honest people out there that, that would like to know what's true, but they hear this come along and they say, wow, that sounds good because, again, they're using the, the, their lust. It's, they're luring through their lust. So there's people out there, and especially when they're not saved, you know, it's, it's easier to get caught up in the, in the lust of your flesh. And just say, wow, well, that sounds great. Maybe this is true. Hey, how great would that be if this is true? And they get caught up in this stuff. And they hear the prosperity preachers. And because this is how they're so deceptive. And this is what you got to watch out for. Whether it's a prosperity preacher or not, you have to watch out for the, for the preachers that might use only one Bible verse for an entire sermon. They'll, they'll, they'll read one scripture from one of these perversions anyways. It's not, even, it's not even from God's Word. It's not from the King James Bible. But they'll read one verse and then they'll talk for another half an hour. And they'll just come up with all these different things. Proverbs 15 is, is one of those places where they might turn to and use as evidence. Now imagine this. You're sitting down, you're listening to someone, and they see, well, the Bible says in the house of the righteous is much treasure, but the revenues of the wicked is trouble. See, and, and, and they can go on and on and on and on. And they say, see, this is what the Bible says. The house of the righteous is much treasure. So, hey, if you're being righteous, you'll have a lot of treasure. You'll, you'll have a lot of good things. See, and they could go on and, and, just, and just, just talk and talk and talk and just preach out of their own wicked heart because they want you to think that gain is godliness. But we already saw in the opening chapter that, that in 1 Timothy 6 that these people are preaching that gain is godliness, but they're wrong. It's easy to take one verse and just completely preach whatever you, whatever you want it to say. Obviously, that's not what this verse is talking about. The treasure that the righteous have isn't on this earth. The treasure that we accumulate for ourselves is in heaven. Those are the rewards that God is going to bless us with when we work for Him and do His work and when we, do, and we live righteously and do good things for Him. That is the, where the treasure is. And that makes sense and that's consistent with Scripture. But they'll take a verse like this and run with it and say, See, this is what the Bible says. And people will hear that and they're ignorant and they don't challenge it and they don't want to go and read it in context and they don't go to read with any other thing or compare with any other part of the Bible. But these people, man, they're slick, they're smooth, they're saying things that they like to hear and they're thinking, man, that's great. Yeah, I want to have a bunch of money. Philippians chapter 4 is another place that they'll use. Very, very common for the prosperity preachers to use Philippians 4 8, 4 18 says but I have all in abound I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you an odor of a sweet smell a sacrifice acceptable well pleasing to God but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. They're saying, see, God's going to supply everything for you. And what they, what they do is they completely overlook the, your need according to His riches. Yeah, God will supply your need, but people's idea of what their needs are is different than what God's idea of what your needs are. That's why the Bible says, with food and raiment, let us be there with content. Your needs is to continue to survive by having food in your belly. And it doesn't mean, you know, three squares or a six-course meal and all this other stuff that people would like to have. It means having sustenance, food to sustain you. Like he fed the children of Israel with manna in the desert for 40 years. They didn't have all these options and, and this gourmet buffet. They had manna. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with the manna, but that's what they had day in and day out. That was the food they lived on. And that's what God provided for them. And they needed to be content with that. And God sustained them. He gave them what they needed. 
food and raiment. But the prosperity preachers will say this, well, see, God will supply all your needs. And people already have in their mind, well, I need, I need a new car. You know, mine's already going, I need a new house. I need this. I need that. And those aren't needs. Those are wants. You may think it's a need. It's not. That's not what God considers to be a need. God says, you're on this planet. I've given you life. You need to continue that life with some food. And in order to continue your life, you're going to need some clothing too. You're not just walking around naked. I'll provide that for you. Those are your needs. But the prosperity preacher will, will, will use these verses and rip them out of context. And again, they'll, they'll run with it. They'll, they'll quickly quote the verse and then they'll just go on and on and on about whatever it is that their wicked heart is, is trying to sell to people so that they'll send them more money. 3 John chapter 1 is another place that's real common that's used by these false prophets, by these prosperity preachers. 3 John chapter 1 verse 2 reads, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So they're saying, see, you know, it's godly, it's righteous for you to be prospering. And now look, you could, you could see how they could take these verses and just run with them. Now there's nothing wrong for wishing somebody to be healthy and to be prosperous. This is John, the Apostle John, writing to other Christians just saying, hey, you know, I, I hope that you're prosperous. And I hope that you're in health, even as thy soul prospers. There's nothing wrong with people prospering, doing well with the things that they're doing. But again, is this even talking about them prospering financially? I don't have any indication. I just say he wants you to prosper. But even if it is financially, you say there's nothing wrong with hoping that somebody else is doing well. But that doesn't mean that you need to be focused on making sure that you get all these riches. And if someone's blessed of God to the point where they actually have a lot of financial wealth, that's not wrong either. But the whole point is that they'll take that and say, see, that's a sign of their godliness. T.J. will be like, well, see, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm such a godly man. He's got all this money. And he thinks that that's why he has all that money as opposed to, to he's ripping people off because he's preaching them a false gospel. in lying to them with deceits and making merchandise of them for filthy lucre's sake. They'll also go to Malachi chapter 3. You could turn there if you'd like. And um, this, is, this is frustrating as well. And this is one of the reasons when, when they teach and they preach, they'll get people to speak evil of the way of truth. Because they'll take these verses that have truth. They all, I mean, all these scriptures are true. They have truth, right? But when someone finally comes out of that nonsense and they find out, they figure out, yeah, these guys are a fraud. Then the people who've, who've finally realized that will often just be disgruntled and disdain the Bible or disdain God's word from that point on because they've already been taken. They've been deceived and they've been tricked. Malachi 3, where it talks about tithing in verse 8, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. Now again, I believe these Bible verses to be absolutely 100% true and correct. And I do believe in the New Testament that people ought to be tithing, giving the 10% of their income to the, the church so that there may be food in God's house. So that way the, the, the pastor or the elders or whoever's you know, in charge of running the church for, so that they can be fed and also so that they could devote 100% of their time to preaching God's Word and to, and to the study and to everything else that goes along the whole job of running a church. So there's nothing wrong with that. But this passage is clearly saying, look, that belongs to God. But what they'll focus on, and what God's saying here is that, look, that's my money, don't rob me. And there's a lot of people who think, well, I don't know how it's even ever going to be possible for me to give 10% of my income, to give, to give a tithe. Because 
I'm poor because I'm struggling because I don't have that much going on. And he's saying, look, if you obey me and give God what, what he deserves and what you owe him, so God will bless you. God will take care of you. God will make sure that your needs are met. You don't have to worry about how it's going to happen in this situation. Now, a tithe is different than a free will offering or an alms or, or other things in above and beyond what you give. But these prosperity preachers will take this message and they'll just use it for saying, see, you know, dig in deep and, and, and just give and give and give and give, give as much till it makes you hurt. And don't worry, have faith because God will God will bless it and he'll just give you way more than that. And that's not what this, this is talking about the tithe. This isn't talking about just, just signing out a check for 10 grand just because the, the preacher's telling you to, that they need so much money for their new swimming pool or something. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. Actually, you know what? No, turn to Jeremiah 14. There's a couple passages in Jeremiah that I want to read. Where are we at with time? we got a little bit of time left. We're doing okay. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah 14. There's, there's multiple passages in Jeremiah that talk about the false prophets. But Matthew 6 teaches us you know, we're not supposed to be laying up for ourselves treasures on this earth. That is not our job. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So those books, you know, your best life now. No, that's not our focus. We're not focused on our best life now. We're not focused on getting the finances and all this other stuff and getting this money accumulated now. We're worried about our best life in the future. We're worried about building up that retirement fund in heaven. Jeremiah 14. Turn if you go to Jeremiah 14. There's some more warnings and admonitions from God about the false prophets, the prophets that are lying and deceiving. Jeremiah 14, 13 reads, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. He's saying, look, Jeremiah saying, look, God, you know, the prophets are saying, these guys are out there saying, hey, everything's going to be just great. So I know that the Babylonians are coming and that they've been defeating people, but you don't have to worry about that. God's with us. You're not going to have famine. There's not going to be hard times. Everything's going to be just fine. And you will always have preachers like that today that just tell you smooth things, good things, make you feel real good. But look at verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto a false vision and divination and a thing of naught. Naught means nothing. And the deceit of their heart. He's saying, I didn't send these guys. They're going out in my name. They're saying, hey, this is what God says, but I'm not saying that. You need to be smart about this. There's a lot of people out there claiming to have a word from God, claiming to have this knowledge from God, and claiming to know this is what God wants you to know. You need to compare that with Scripture. This is the truth. Don't go around your whole life needing to be spoon-fed from somebody what you believe and have to have someone interpret everything for you from the Bible. Read it for yourself. There's a lot of liars out there. There's a lot of deceivers, people trying to trick you. And if you don't know what God's Word says, you will get deceived. You will get tricked. Because these people are smooth. And they're going around saying it's from God, but it's not. Verse 15, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land, by sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. And they shall have none to bury them. 
them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Look, God holds you responsible just as much as he's holding those false prophets responsible. He's saying, you know what? Those guys that are preaching, oh, everything's just fine. Oh, yeah, peace and safety, and, and we're not going to have famine. He says, you know what? The sword and the famine are going to get them. Come right, I'm going to make sure it comes right back. They're going to suffer the very things they're saying that you're not going to go through. They're going to receive that. And then he says, not only that, you people who are listening to these liars, you people who are just listening to these deceivers that want to hear these lies and say, oh yeah, that sounds great. He says, I'm going to cast you out into the streets. The famine and the sword are going to come because it's true, because that's what, that's what Jeremiah was prophesying about because God is bringing it. God was bringing judgment. He's trying to warn the people. And those people are not going to heed the warning. They're going to get run over. They are going to reap that destruction and that punishment that is coming. There are always dangers ahead. If you're listening to someone that claims to be a messenger from God or claims to be a preacher, claims to know God's word and wants to preach it to you and they're not giving you warnings. You have to question, what's their motivation? Why are they not warning you? Oh, I could turn to many scriptures that tell you, we've already seen a few of them. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. That's the job of the preacher. Best case scenario, that person who's not giving you the warnings is just really ignorant and shouldn't be in that job because he really doesn't know anything. And he's honestly not knowing anything. But more likely than not, they know what they're doing. And they're choosing not to give you those warnings because they don't love you because they love money. Because it's a lot easier to get up and tell everybody that everything's just fine and go back to sleep. People are in a good mood. They're going to be opening up their pockets saying, ah, that's great. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. That's what I like to hear. Turn if you would to Gen uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. Just a little bit forward. We were in 14. Turn to chapter 23. A little bit more about the false prophets. Verse 16 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. He's saying they're just saying whatever they want to say. It's coming out of their own heart. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. So they're literally telling people that walk after their own imaginations, that just do whatever they think is right. Nah, you're fine. There's no problems. I mean, imagine how, how wicked this is. Think about this. And you need to understand how wicked these false prophets are. Imagine you have somebody and they're blind and they're, and they're saying, I need to go to the doctor. I need to go to the hospital. And they're walking. They're walking along the path and they come across you and they're saying, which way do I need to go? I need to get to the doctor so I can get my eyes fixed. And they say, oh yeah, keep going the way you're going. You're doing great right now. And just in front of them, about 20 yards in front of them, is the edge of a cliff. Yet, these people are saying, oh yeah, you're doing great. You're on the right track. Keep doing what you're doing. You will get there soon. And they're going to fall to their doom. No warning. No saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on a second, guy. Hold on a second. You're going the wrong way. You got to go this way. Nope. That's not what the false prophet does. Say, no evil is going to come upon you. 
Keep, keep walking after the imagination of your heart. Whatever you think is good is good. Hey, God's the one that gave you that heart, so you're, just, you're doing just fine. It's wickedness. Verse 18, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Again, this is one of the jobs of the preacher. He's saying, if these false prophets would have stood in my counsel, if they would have done what I was telling them to do, he says, and they would have caused my people to hear my words, to hear God's own words. He said, they would have caused them to hear this, and then they should have turned them from their evil way. That's the job, is... is for the, the preacher to preach God's words. Not the things out of my own heart, but God's words. Thus saith the Lord. To the intent that you would turn from your evil ways. Change what's wrong. Change the things that are contrary to God's word. The things that get God angry. Yes, God gets angry. God is long-suffering and merciful, but He also has a lot of anger. We don't need to continue doing things that's just going to make God angry. It's going to bring distress and bring grief upon us. I know it's not pleasant to hear you're doing something wrong. Most people don't want to hear that. But would you rather just go through the, the chastening or chastising or, or worse from God if you're not saved? No, the goal of the preaching is, is to help people to turn from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. And they're saying, if you do that, if you would have just done that, if you would just preach, God's word will work. God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And, it's, and it, you know, it's capable to divide asunder even the soul and the spirit. It's, 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 it's capable of piercing through right to the heart. God's word, not your own words, not the imagination of your heart. God's word can pierce right through somebody and convict that person and make them see the error of their ways and change. But you have to be preaching God's word. You can't just be making stuff up because you just want people to throw money in the plate and you want to attract big crowds and get even more money. We don't have a lot of people in this church. And I don't know if we ever will. I would love to have a lot more people in this church, but I'll tell you right now, my goal is not to make a bunch of money. That's not why I'm doing this. If I wanted to make a bunch of money, I wouldn't even go into this profession. I wouldn't even try to be a pastor. I can make a whole bunch of money doing other things. That's not my motivation, and it's definitely not my motivation here. The preaching's not going to change, unless maybe it's going to get a little bit harder if I learn... You know, the more I learn about the Bible, that's the only way it's going to change. It's going to be more in line with Scripture. I'm not going to lie to people. I never will. I don't care how many people end up coming to this church. I will never stand up here and lie to people for filthy lucre's sake. It's not going to happen. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 23. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Saith the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth? Saith the Lord, I have heard what the prophets said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. These false prophets are steering people away from the Lord. And they'll say, oh yeah, I've got this great vision. I mean, this reminds me of the Joseph Smiths. 
and the Russellites that say, oh, yeah, man, this, this guy had this dream. He had this vision. And you know what? This is what the, what the truth is. And they're steering people away from the Lord and towards Baal, towards Satan. The Mormons are a cult that worship Satan. The Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult that worship Satan. They have these false prophets that had these dreams and had these visions. And they didn't come true. Their prophecies didn't come to pass. They're false prophets. They did not speak that which came from the Lord. Yeah, how much money do you think is funneling through the Watchtower organization? How much money is funneling through those temples, those Mormon temples? They preach for filthy lucre because they're false prophets. They have a false gospel. Verse 28, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? God's word is like a fire. What does a fire do? It consumes. He says it's like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. That's the strength and the power of God's word. It's not going to be these smooth things. Verse 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord. And do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Lightness is just not making a big deal of it. So your sin's not that big of a deal. Yeah, keep doing the wickedness of your ways. It's not a big deal. They cause people to err, to make mistakes, to, to do things contrary to God because they're lying to them. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Last point I want to make. Whenever you hear these preachers, and maybe you're not sure. Maybe, maybe you're newer to this. Maybe you haven't heard about these names. Maybe you haven't heard a whole lot about Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes. Maybe you're, you're, you've gotten saved and you're happy and you're a Christian. You're starting to think, you know, most Christians start to think that a lot of people, after you get saved, you start to think a lot of people are saved. But that's not true. You get excited and you think, oh man, this is great. That's great. Yeah, there's all these people. They're all working for God. Look at they're doing these great things. People who are real young in the faith, they don't always understand because they don't know very much doctrine because they haven't learned yet. They're just a babe in Christ. And I get it. I understand. But that's why I'm preaching this message so that you can understand that these people exist. You need to be on the lookout for them. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're false prophets. They're out to deceive. And they're out to make money off of you. Don't think that just because someone claims the name of Christ that they're a good guy, that they're doing a good work for the Lord. Because most of them aren't. Most of them are just in it for the money. Most of them are preaching lies. Here's a good test to figure out if somebody's a false prophet. Luke 6, 26 says, Woe unto you. Jesus Christ said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. He's saying if you're a prophet, if you're a preacher, and all men are just saying good things about you, he says, woe unto you. He says, that's a sign of a false prophet. He says, that's what their fathers did to the false prophets. They said all kinds of great things. Everybody, everybody held them in high regard. This is why you have, you know, America's pastor, Billy Graham, right? Who says a bad thing about him except for the, the fire-breathing independent Baptists that, that know the truth? 
that are calling out the false prophets. They're the only ones that are saying anything bad about them. But you, you know that if Billy Graham came into town anywhere, you know, the city officials and the town would go crazy and they'd have, you know, he'd draw these huge crowds. If he wanted to be on television, you know, any station would have him on. The world has no problem with Billy Graham. The world has no problem with Rick Warren. The world has no problem with Joel Osteen. Oh, yeah, he's preaching a positive message. I mean, it's just like these self-help people, right? The world doesn't care about those people. They say, oh, he's trying to make people's lives better. They just talk about nice things, fun things, positive things, just to make your life a little bit better. When woe unto them. Second, Second Timothy chapter 3. Silence. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12 reads, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at, your, look at, these, look at these TV preachers. You think, they, they claim they're living so godly, right? They're these God, look at the influence they have. Oh man, they're winning all these people to the Lord and all this other stuff. Where's their persecution? The Bible says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You think they're a great man of God? Where's their persecution? Another test to test these prosperity preachers or any any preacher for that matter. Matthew 10, last place. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10, verse number 24. This is what you can expect from somebody who's preaching God's Word. If you want to look at, at what's the result of someone who is faithfully, boldly preaching the Word of the Lord, Matthew 10, 24 says, The disciple is not above his master. You say, you're, you're the follower. You're following your leader. You're not better than them. You're learning from them. The disciple is not above his master. You're below your master. He says, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple to be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they, and then he says, okay, you know, it's, it's enough for you to try to be as, you know, to reach up to that level, to be as good as them. But you're not better. The disciple is not above his master. And then he says this, he says, if they have called the master of the house, you know, no, no, no one's above the master of the house, everyone's below the master. If they've called the master of the house, Beelzebub, Satan, literally, because that's what they called Jesus Christ. They called him Satan. They thought he was Baal. They said, by the power of Beelzebub, he's casting out these spirits. That's what they said about Jesus Christ. They said, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? He's saying, how many worse things are they going to say to you? Because you're not even as good. I mean, look at, are you Jesus Christ walking around with perfection that nobody has anything they could possibly say? You have zero sin in your life because Jesus Christ had nothing wrong. And they called him the devil. How much more do you think they're going to call you? You're not better than Jesus. You're not above your master. You think that the whole world is just going to love you when they hated Christ? If they hated Christ, they're going to hate you even more. That's what Jesus said. Where's the hatred of T.D. Jakes? Where's the hatred of Joel Osteen? Everybody loves them. Where's the controversy when someone posts the Joel Osteen clip on Facebook? No one's giving it. No one's saying, oh, I can't believe you'd post something like this. They're, they're, you know, it's getting thumbs up and, oh, yeah, this was great. Oh, yeah, he's such a great deal. Everybody loves him. Everybody loves him. You get people of other religions love those guys. Why? Because they're not of God. They're not above their master. Their master is Satan. They're deceivers. Don't get caught up in their nonsense. Don't think that because they claim the name of Christ, oh, they're doing this great work. No. 
There are lots of deceivers out there. There are lots of false prophets. We need to be aware of them. We need to watch out for them. You need to know what they're all about. They're all about money. And they're all about getting your money. Don't give them a dime. Let's bow our heads and a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for all the warnings that you give us, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to, to understand the warnings and to heed them, dear Lord, that we don't get deceived and get tricked by other people, by sin or by these false prophets, dear Lord. I thank you so much for, for helping me and leading me to a church where there was a, a preacher that wasn't afraid to preach your word, dear God, that I could learn a lot of truths and that I could get a lot of sin out of my life because I finally know and see, have seen your words, dear God. I pray that you please help me to do likewise. Help me to show other people their wicked ways and show them their sins that they can get right with you, dear Lord. That they can avoid more hardship and troubles in their life because they get right with you. Lord, help me to, to, to teach and to train a whole multitude of people that will be zealous of good works towards you, dear God, and that love you and that want to know the truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.